said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people. The work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Isn't it amazing that through a gift box, God has raised up intercessors and preachers? I believe the Lord is reminding us today that even in the midst of this pandemic, we are to look upon the nations, to observe, to be astonished, to wonder, because He is doing something mighty. This calling to serve Jesus in this way uh, is the rallying call. That's the sound of the trumpet, the urgency of this gospel that we get to serve, the urgency that He's calling us to introduce more and more people, more and more children, to a, a loving God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Each of you and all of the many volunteers that you represent are the heart and soul and engine driving Operation Christmas Child. During this pandemic, the Lord has continued to encourage and to equip the local church and the body of Christ. The idea that we could have collected more than nine million shoebox gifts around the world in the middle of a pandemic, I believe is miraculous. Samaritan's Purse, Operation Christmas Child volunteers are rallying around the opportunity to share the gospel. We're rallying toward National Collection Week, where we seek to send another set of nearly 10 million gospel opportunities around the world. We still have time, we still have opportunity. The Lord has not returned yet. We want to keep pushing and going forward and doing whatever we can do to reach more, share with more, equip more to share more. When the mountain seems too big, the challenge seems way too big, the goal is way too big, God will go before us and fight our battles. Now it's time. And Jesus said the fields are not white in four months, they're white today. And we want to we wanna be faithful to that. And that's the opportunity the Lord has given Samaritan's Purse and, and the Operation Christmas Child Project. Isn't that good news and great joy? Uh, just to see the smiles on the, on the kids' faces, it's just amazing. I've had over the number of years had a, uh, been able to work with Samaritan's Purse in different capacities and, and even in their warehouse, and I know some of you also have done that, and the need is still great. And as they said, they've sent 9 million shoeboxes across the world this year. If they did that during the pandemic when everything was closed all up tight, they want to do 10 million this year. So, so please, pick up your box at the back in the foyer. It's not like origami. It's very easy to fold up, really. Trust me. And then also, the, uh, the shoe boxes then can be brought up here and put there. Um, we will um, eventually send them all out together. There is no, no longer a warehouse here in Kitchener or Waterloo or even Cambridge to put the, take them to, but they are taken to a church who sends them out to Calgary, so um, to the warehouse there. So. Um, West Africa and I think South America are the two places where the local, the, the shoe boxes that are collected are, are taken, uh, are being sent to. So it's exciting to be part of that. They don't just give them gifts, they actually give them uh, the message of the gospel. And they actually uh, do um, have Bible studies with them and they just encourage them to seek the Lord. And in some cases, the kids have never heard that before. So it's an amazing. Amazing opportunity for all of you at Faith Church here to be able to participate in that. So welcome. Thank you for coming this morning. And uh, those online, we welcome you. We just uh, thank you that you're here. And uh, we just want to give you opportunities to, to bless others. So not only with Samaritan's Purse, the deadline again is November 14th, we also have suggested in our newsletter that you maybe write to our missionaries. We've got missionaries that we support throughout, um, that, that actually do mission work in different places. So we are just suggesting you maybe in this time of the pandemic when things are a little bit slower for them or when they're uh, not able to get back to the countries that they so um, 
really want to get back to to, uh, to be able to pray and, and uh, help others, um, we will uh, write them notes, right? Write them little notes of encouragement, just like this, a little card, that's all you need to do. And so uh, it would really bless them and encourage them during this time when they're actually at, uh, sitting at home, not able to do as much as they want. So um, with that, uh, I just want to say, did you see the pictures, any of you who have internet, the amazing pictures of uh, our harvest event that we just had a couple of weeks ago? Wasn't that amazing with all those kids? That was so great. And there were so many kids that were blessed because of that. And we have something else going on. So it's actually our, our trunk of treasure that will be done on October 30th. And if you are creative, if you have the strength and the ability to, um, to help, to volunteer, if you have a vehicle, a car that can be decorated, um, speak to Harold uh, Schnell or, P or Jennifer Reichman and just see um, what you can do, how you can tap into that and bless kids in this next, next time. It'll be a fun time. And uh, I think the last time there was close to 100 people. So it's amazing how we can reach out into the, uh, the local community too to get, that, get people coming. Seniors. We have not forgotten to do an event for you. This Thursday is um, our luncheon. So the second Thursday of every month, we are planning to have a luncheon downstairs in the basement. You come in by the, uh, the back doors, the patio doors, they'll be unlocked. But we are uh, making sure that we're still socially distant. You have to wear a mask till you sit down. Um, but we're going to have fun this Thursday. It's fajita fun, we called it. So we actually have Dan and Anne Marie Chapel from uh, missionaries from Mexico that will be coming and speaking to you about some of the things that they do in Mexico and about their future plans for uh, their mission work. And we will learn some Mexican phrases. Really, trust me, you're going to be able to speak Mexican or Spanish by the time we're finished this. We're going to eat some Mexican food um, or Spanish, whichever you prefer. Not too spicy, I promise, not too spicy, but we will even learn how to fold up a fajita properly. And after we've filled up our faces and we've talked and chatted and that, we are going to have our own Marianne Sariga leading us in some chair exercises or standing exercises in a, with a Spanish tone to them. So if you don't know the Macarena, maybe practice it now, okay? Um, so at any point, um, we do want you to sign up for that, seniors. We need to have uh, you pre-register. Otherwise, we ha we've capped it at 25 people. So think about that. Um, anyway, let's just uh, uh, start with prayer. First of all, let's just close our eyes. And Lord, we just come to you. We thank you for this opportunity to meet together in person and online. Lord, your Holy Spirit can work anywhere. And so we ask that you be with us, that you guide and direct our thoughts, that you close off all those thoughts that, of the rushing and the busyness of the world around us so we can devote our time just to you right now, Lord. We ask that you be with us again in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, we ask all the kids, all the kids to come up and just sit right down here on the floor for our kids' corner. All the kids up here on the floor. Parents can come too if you want, but we'll have all the kids here, please. And just have a seat on the floor. Just anywhere here, Noah. How exciting to see so many kids. I'm really excited and happy. Um, I just want to talk to you today. Who knows what this weekend is? What's this weekend? That's correct, Thanksgiving, very good. And you know, there are reasons why we should be thankful. Can you think of a reason why we'd be thankful? Can anybody tell me? Why, Keaton? We'll let Keaton think his... Thank you for your mom. Yes, moms are very special. Anybody else? Aurora? Getting together with the family members. Evan, can you think of something? A 
kazoo. Your kazoo? Yeah. What about you, Noah? Can you think of anything? No, that's okay. This is Thanksgiving weekend, and we have lots of things that can make us happy or sad. But um, when we feel happy, we need to realize that God is good to us, whether we're happy or sad. We have to remember to thank him. We thank him that he gave us Jesus, his son, to be our savior. There are lots of ways that we can show that we're thankful. Can you think of some? Can anybody name one way we could show that we're thankful? <laughs> Noah, that's right. We could raise our hands. Anybody else have any ideas? Evan? We could sing songs, yes, we could make music. That's one of my favorite ways. I work for a music company, so that's why I enjoy it. So one of the ways that we can remember to say thank you to God, we want to remember that God gave us his son Jesus to be our savior so we can be children of God when Jesus is our savior. Isn't that awesome? So last time I was up, we talked about kazoos and we had made music. Today we're going to learn a different way to make music. You can do this when you go home with your parents' help, okay? So one of the th songs that we're going to sing this week is called Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. And um, I had a hard time getting this in tune, but I just want you to hear this for a minute, okay? Give thanks, give thanks with a grateful heart. Can we say that line all together? Give thanks with a grateful heart. Once more. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Awesome, that's the starting line. And one of the things that we want you to do, you're gonna see at the end of today is, Thanksgiving is remembering to thank God that he sent his son, Jesus, to live in our hearts. And when he lives in our hearts, then Jesus guides us every step with his Holy Spirit to help to make decisions and to be thankful. Even when we're sad, we remember that Jesus lives in our heart. Okay? So we're going to go back to our desks, and I'm going to leave each one of you these there, and you can color them. But I have a special assignment for you. What I want you to do at Thanksgiving, most of us will be with family, I want you to color your uh, heart at the back, and I would like you to share Jesus with somebody during Thanksgiving to say, I am thankful that God sent his son, Jesus, to save me, to love me, and to allow me to be a child of God. So it's important when you color this, you think of somebody special at your Thanksgiving time, dinner, weekend, that you can give this to and share that good news with, okay? Great, so we'll have everybody go to the back now. Oh, wait a minute, one more thing. I'd like to call Alexis up. So just so you, that you know, <clears throat> sorry, Alexis. We do a lot of things, I'll get you to hold on to that, Alexis. We do a lot of things in Kids Corner, including Midweek Club, that's done online, um, virtually. And one of the things that the children do in their packages that they get is a memory verse, but also on, is it Tuesday nights, Alexis? Yes. Tuesday nights, they are also um, schooled in uh, some biblical teaching. And one of the things they have to do is recite their memory verse. So I've asked Alexis if she would come up and share the memory verse for this month so you could all hear that. You go ahead. The glory of God. <coughs> it's okay. The glory of God declares. Yeah. The heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Psalms 19, verse 1. Very good. Thank you, Alexis. That was great. Thank you very much. And children, I'll have you go to the back, please. Okay? So welcome, everyone. It's not just children who need to have grateful hearts and give thanks to the Lord. We all need to. Um, 
give him glory and thanks and praise for he is good. So I invite you all to stand with us if you are able. We're going to sing that song that Noria was playing on the water glasses. Give thanks with a grateful heart. and direct it to God and say we give thanks with a grateful heart to you Holy One because you've given Jesus Christ your son
going to get rid of my guitar because this next song, I want a little bit of freedom to move. Psalm 100 says, it's a psalm for giving grateful praise. We're going to put the words up on the screen, and I would like you to proclaim this together with us. Ready? Here we go. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. God is good all the time and we are going to sing that. is good all the time he put a song of praise in this heart of mine God is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine God is good he is good Time. Here we go. shadows all around. Do not fear, he will guide you, he will keep you safe and sound. Because he's promised, he, he has, has promised, promised to never leave you, nor forsake you. And his word is true, God is good. can stand and testify that his love is everlasting and his mercies they will never end God is good all the time he put a song of praise in this heart of mine God is good all the time through the darkest
God, you are good. Your love endures forever. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, Faith Church. Uh, this is an opportunity that we're going to take to lift up our congregation. That means everybody in this room and everybody online in prayer. That we would uh, appeal to God uh, and uh, talk to Him. Ask Him things and thank Him for things. So, Lord, we would uh, go ahead and do that. So, we thank you, Holy Spirit that you've acted on our hearts this morning to bring us here in this place or online to meet the only true God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you sent this Lord Jesus Christ into our midst, that through his sacrifice on the cross, we would be reconciled to you, God, who is merciful and just. You brought us into a love relationship that has brought us great peace and joy. As we gather in your holy presence, we give you reverence, honor, and majesty. With gratitude in our hearts, we honor our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has done a mighty work of salvation in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to sustain us that we would have the perseverance to remain loyal and faithful to you, grow our faith, give us the discernment necessary to recognize the dangers of the pagan, corrupt culture that surrounds us, a culture that entices and deceives us with idols, power, and luxury. We pray, Lord, that we would not do anything to shame your holy name. Help us to extend our love and respect to those who have gathered together today with us, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Put a servant attitude in our hearts that we would put the needs of others above our own. Things that are done in love are not convenient or burdensome. Lord, we are happy to do them. Help us to curb any anger we have or any desire for retaliation in our sometimes difficult relationships with family, friends, and brothers and sisters in Christ, perhaps even here in this church. Give us the strength and ability to practice unselfishness, forgiveness, and love, and if necessary, to willingly suffer loss. Give us the ability to extend grace to those who have wronged us if it is possible, as far as it depends on us, let us live at peace with everyone. Condition our hearts to consider with great alarm the apparent hopelessness of the unbelieving wicked world around us. Pray that we do not look at the fallen world with disrespect or condemnation or judgment or disdain. Let us not consider them as unredeemable nor assume there's no hope for them. Give us empathetic hearts that we might have love and concern for the unbelieving. We acknowledge that there may be some amongst us or within our own families who have not experienced the joy and peace of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, reveal yourself to them. Use us as your servants to be bold in approaching them and sharing the reason for our faith in you. Please put the words that you would have them here in our mouths. We thank you for the many blessings you bestowed upon us. Lord, we also reflect on the trials and tribulations that come into our lives and the lives of our loved ones. We ask that you would bring understanding in these situations, bring comfort, healing, and peace. Lord, reveal yourself Today, as you, we worship you with praise and thanksgiving, we want to experience you, stir our hearts, and make us alive. We lift up Pastor Devin as he brings your holy word to us this morning. Give him confidence and guide his lips as he speaks your truth to us. 
May the message you have inspired him to present to us enter attentive hearts and minds. All power, majesty, and glory to God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Good morning, church. How are you? Good. Good morning, online audience. Thanks for tuning in from home. Happy Thanksgiving. It's good to be together. It's good to give glory and give thanks together. I woke up this morning and I just immediately thank God for the sunshine. Put up your hand if you did the same. Yes, that's good. That's what we want to be doing, giving thanks. And you online, you can give thanks. We have technology and an incredible worship team and tech team to keep this going so that we can worship together in a sense. Well, if you're new and visiting, thanks for joining us. If you're part of family and you've just been invited, thank you for coming to our church service. And if you're new online, of course, this is your first time, uh, welcome. Welcome to Faith Church, both in person and online. My name is Devin. I'm the lead pastor here. And, uh, and, and so I'll be bringing the word of God to you about Thanksgiving, the whole topic this morning. We're actually going to take a break from our typical series, which is the majesty of the Messiah. And we've been looking at the majesty of Christ in all his different titles, trying to uplift Christ, present a compelling picture of Christ that we might strive after him and serve him. But because it's Thanksgiving, I want us to take a break and dwell on this topic, Thanksgiving, just because it's on everybody's minds. We're gathering together, whether in small little groups for turkey or maybe in a little bit bigger groups with extended family, um, we are thinking about this topic. So it's important to look at that scripturally, I think, too. So thankfulness, thanksgiving, why do we need to be thankful? Why do we even have a holiday at all to teach us to be thankful? Why do we have to, here's another question, why do we have to train toddlers to be thankful? Hey, okay, I've learned that. <laughs> and we have to get them to say magic words, say the magic words, right? But we see that not only in small little people like children, we see that everywhere, even in our own adult hearts. You know, maybe you go to uh, Starbucks, let's say, and you pick up an expensive coffee for someone, and they take it and, well, where's the cream? I said two creams, not one. I can't have this. Maybe you've been that person. <laughs> And of course, we see that in children, right? They demand, they demand, gimme, gimme. And then you give it to them and they run away with it without saying thank you. Then they come back, say, gimme more. And they demand more without even saying thank you for the last thing that you did. And that kind of irks us a little bit, right? We don't like that ingratitude. We don't like seeing that anywhere. Well, what's the primary reason for this universal ingratitude that we see everywhere? And I think there are a lot of reasons for this. You could say, well, some people just have not counted their blessings. They don't know how blessed they are. Some people are just forgetful creatures. They just wake up and they forget. Some people maybe put themselves on a pedestal too high and they demand that they be blessed to a certain expectation that the whole world serve them. It could be pride. There's a lot of different reasons why I think there's ingratitude all around in this whole world and even in the Christian life. But this morning, I want to open up to you human nature a little bit and hopefully we might be able to see the root cause of ingratitude and then we might be able to see the remedy for that cause to help us be grateful creatures, grateful people, not just over a turkey or if you're like me, a ham, dinner, but be thankful all your life. And to have that disposition to be a thankful person. To wake up and you see the sunshine. And instead of deciding not to complain, you bring thanks to God. That sort of compass needle defaulting to thankfulness. And so I'm going to open up passage to you. This is not from my smarts. I've only been around for so many years. Many of you have lived many more years and more lessons from the Lord. But this is a principle from the word of God that I'll explain. So I hope uh, you will Track with me on this. A title for today's message is A Theater of God and the Applause of Thankfulness. 
It's an analogy which you'll hear throughout the message. A theater of God and the applause of thankfulness. So if you want to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1 verse 20. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 and 21. Just two verses this morning. Not an entire passage, but just two verses because there's a lot in there. And it reads, For since the creation of the world's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. The message will be broken up based on the verse. I want to look at the knowledge of God. What does that mean? They knew God. I want to look at the honor of God. What does it mean to actually honor God? And then thankfulness to God. What is that? And last thing, I'm going to end the message with a, a a warning and an encouragement. So let's pray as we go into this these two verses together. Father, we come to you as your church and we, we've opened up your word. We've heard it. This is from your lips. You have inspired this text and it's for us. You've given it to us as a gift that we might understand what thankfulness and ingratitude is. So Holy Spirit, let the word of God be living and active today. Help us be grateful creatures from this passage. Teach us, Holy Spirit, come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first part of this verse is the knowledge of God. Paul said, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, what are they? He says eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. They have been seen, being understood from what's been made so that people are without excuse. If you've read Romans, you'll know for the first three chapters, the Apostle Paul who wrote this book has been trying to show the reader that all of mankind and the reader included all fall under the just judgment of God. That we've all sinned, that we've all broken God's perfect moral standards and thereby stand condemned as criminals before God. And so Paul starts with the bad news for the first three chapters and he's trying to lay out the arguments And then finally in chapter 3, he comes to the cross when people are ready. A lot of people today are not ready for the cross because they first have to come to the realization that they've sinned, that there's bad news. And this is what Paul is trying to do. And in chapter 3, he presents the glorious cross in hopes the person will put faith in Christ based on their recognition of their need being sinners. But in chapter 1, with his prerogative to teach us that we're all sinners... He first begins with this, knowledge, knowledge of God and creation. He's saying all of us, all of mankind can see God's invisible qualities as they gaze at creation, his invisible qualities as they gaze at creation. That means anytime a person walks about this world and they see a sparkle maybe on the Grand River, whether they see glory in a person been watching documentary on Michael Jordan, glory of, of, of God inside of a person that can razzle everybody, or the beauty of a sunset, or you look at an oak tree and see the strength of that, or you've been watching a monarch butterfly fly around and scratch your head, and how does it figure out where to go and where to come back? In all of that, we can see God's invisible personality, as Paul says, his divine nature and his eternal power. All of mankind can see it. All of them. Every single person. That's what the Bible is saying. John Calvin calls creation God's theater. Creation is God's theater. This realm on this world with man, people, beasts, oceans, seas, all of it is God's theater. And you think about a theater. What do you do? You spectate, right? We're walking through God's theater every day while God puts his personality on display And the props are his creation. And in the props are his personality, his eternal power, his divine nature, his invisible qualities. And they're all putting on a play for us. When you see the monarch, that's a prop. And it's trying to teach us something about the nature of God. 
The theologians call this the general revelation. That God has revealed to all of mankind some general things about God. He's eternal, he's all-powerful, that he's wise, that he's orderly, just some general things. But all mankind can pick that up as they walk throughout creation. And Paul says, based on that knowledge, they are without excuse. Well, maybe you're here and you're, you're thinking, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't see that. I look at creation and I, I don't see that. Well, the Bible says you actually do. You do see it. It's deep within your sense. When we look at God's glory, it ought to cause us to wonder and be grateful and ought to bring us to the knowledge that there is a God behind it all. Just recently, we were watching uh, a family movie together, uh, Charlotte's Web. You'll probably remember that from grade four, if you're around my age, and the teacher read it to me. And I remembered it and was impressed by it. And I saw the movie just recently, and apparently my wife has watched it a number of times, and so I'm catching up. But it's a wonderful movie, and I think it's in keeping with the book. And essentially, if you're not sure about it, it's, it's about um, a pig on a farm. And he knows he's going to be slaughtered and turned into bacon by his farmer. He knows his purpose. But he doesn't want to go there. And so he befriends this talking spider. And they sort of plan together. And the spider decides to, as it's spinning its web, create little messages and words in the spider web to capture the attention of the farmer and the community to convince everybody that this pig is special so that they would not turn this pig into bacon. Not to spoil it, but it worked. And there's the scene in that story and in that movie that I want to just relay to you. Listen to it because it talks about general revelation, the knowledge of God. Mrs. Arabelle said, Do you understand how there could be any writing in a spider's web? Oh, no, said Dr. Dorian. I don't understand it, but for that matter, I don't understand how a spider learned to spin a web in the first place. When the words appeared, everyone said they were a miracle. But nobody pointed out that the web itself is a miracle. What's miraculous about a spider's web, said Mrs. Arable. I don't see why you say a spider's web is a miracle. It's just a web. Ever try to spin one, said Dr. Dorian. Mrs. Arable shifted uneasily in her chair. No, she replied. But I can crochet a doily and I can knit a sock. Sure, said the doctor, but somebody taught you, didn't they? Well, my mother taught me. Well, who taught the spider? A young spider knows how to spin a web without any instructions from anybody. Don't you regard that as a miracle? I, I suppose so, Mrs. Arable. I never looked at it that way before. Still, I don't understand it. I don't like what I can't understand. None of us do, Dr. Dorian said. I'm a doctor. Doctors are supposed to understand everything, but I don't understand everything, and I don't intend to let it worry me. There it is, within a spider's web even. You can see something deeper than just matter. To slow down and look at the complexity of this world, the wonder, the intelligence latent in it, the grandeur, even in the smallest thing like a spider web, should lead us to a knowledge of God. That there is an intelligent, wondrous, magnificent, and glorious God behind it all. And this teaching that creation preaches and speaks to us that there is a God is also found in the words of David. It's a psalm, Psalm 19, verse 1 to 4, which was the same verse that our kids' ministry is now memorizing. And it's also a verse that our men's ministry has been going through as well. It's incredible. You can see the hand of God orchestrating a church to teach it, right? He says, David, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. We've all heard it. God is glorious. I've been created. We hear it. Not with our physical ears, but the ears of our heart. I ask you this morning, are you new to the church? Are you new to God? Are you new to the Bible, to anything religious? And you're joining us this morning and you know deep down you've had that innate sense when you've looked at something before. 
What have you done with that thought? It's subtle, it's small, but it's there. It's easy to get, to ignore it. Have you followed that thought? Have you followed it to the end to believe in God? Or have you ignored it, suppressed it, and have sort of pushed it aside? Well, after you're done here this morning, maybe online or in person, you'll still be preached to. When you look down at the ant, the ant will say, look who gave me the organizational power. Look, I'm organized all the way for winter. I'm preparing. Who taught me this? When you look at the skies and you drive home again, you're going to capture some artistic brush of God and the sky will say in your heart, how could I just be this beautiful? But not only do we perceive God through the beauty of creation, we can also perceive God through his invisible hand through creation. His invisible hand through creation. We might call this the governance of God, his power to control all things. There is a creator, of course, who created the whole world, but he also holds it together constantly. He governs it. And so the knowledge of God not only just includes you looking at something beautiful and saying, there must be a God, but you also look at creation, see it being held together, see it being controlled by an invisible hand and say, there must be an active God in creation. And so all the ebb and flow, the tides go in, the tides go out, boom and bust, rhythms and seasons, blessings and cursings, are all sovereignly guided by this invisible, powerful divine hand as well. I read a story of this man who once had been delivered of miraculous and countless uh, tragedies. He had so many near misses. He pulled through multiple diseases. He survived car accidents. Again, so many freakish near misses in his life. And he was relaying all this over to the Christian beside him, and the Christian Um, beside him was ready to shake his hand in great respect and say, wow, you must have a deep faith in God seeing how his hand is so evident on your life. And the man said, oh, well, I'm just lucky. The knowledge of God's governance over this man provided great affirmation for the Christian. But for the one who's delivered multiple times, he suppressed the knowledge, he ignored it, and he chalked it up to just something nebulous called luck, whatever that is. It's unfortunate. Maybe you're here this morning and you've had some near misses, some strange what you might call coincidences. And you've wondered, well, maybe there is a God. Like This doesn't seem just by chance. I would encourage you to follow that thought. That knowledge that we have that God is everywhere and beholding and in creation and holding creation together it's not within a christian's brain only it's also within somebody who doesn't believe in god all nations everywhere worship some higher being why because they go out in creation and they know there's some kind of god out there and that's why we're prone to worship that's why there are so many religions that's why you go out in the bush and they're still worshiping some kind of divine being Because we can see it. It's evident. So this is what the theologians call general revelation in that creation's a theater and we're going about looking at the theater. Well, next is the honor of God. Paul says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified, or maybe another translation says, honor him as God. Verse 21. So he begins to show the reader the evilness of mankind, our unwillingness to worship or honor God despite the the knowledge that we have of God. And Paul says this is the very first affront, the very first breaking of any commandments of mankind. It's a refusal to worship God. That's the first sin of mankind, a refusal to worship God, a refusal to honor God. That's what Paul is saying here. That even despite God pouring out blessings and there being recipients of it and God showing his beauty through creation constantly they refuse to give thanks and they refuse to honor God and that's the big sin of us all of us isn't it all of us Romans 3 2 all have sinned all of us have failed to bring God glory all of us have failed to bring God the thanks he deserves So universal knowledge and then a universal sin because we've not acted on that knowledge. 
Look at that word, they. The word they in this verse refers to mankind at large, all of us, of course, of us refusing to honor God. But Paul says that this they is really us expressing who we are. It's opening up our human heart to us. Though God knows that we are sinners, he still blesses us and we don't return thanks back to him and therein we find our human nature. Our human nature is against God. We are apathetic toward him. We may be on the pinnacle of blessing and health and everything and deep within our natures, we still do not want to honor and give thanks to God. And so here we have a universal nature that we are sinners, that we are irreverent, and that we are ungrateful. Ungratefulness is a universal spiritual disease, in other words. It's an Universal spiritual disease. We all have it. This is why it's everywhere. It's prevalent. And this is also why we stand condemned by God, all of mankind. As God says, you are sinners. You have not returned to me honor and thanksgiving because of who we are, our hearts. In the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve did honor God. They did thank God. But after that, they rebelled and didn't give God honor and thanksgiving. And then after that, we became an irreverent and ungrateful race. And it still continues. This, is, this explains why thanksgiving to God, which can be difficult for us even as Christians, it's still a struggle. It's still a struggle because it's part of our sinful inclination. It still is there within our natures. But we must, with all our might, Christian, fight against that. Repent of it. Turn from it. Train yourself in keeping with your new nature. You do have a new nature to give glory and thanksgiving to God. That's who you are. And you say that within your heart. Yes, I want to do that more. But you still feel ungratefulness sometimes. And that bothers you. Fight against that sin. Highlight it and say, no, God will receive thanksgiving from my heart. We have to fight. And you know, it becomes even harder in the pandemic this last year. There's a lot of complaining and, you know, rightfully so in some ways because of what we've just been through and what we're still going through worldwide but even in blessing and even in cursing there's blessing right just because god has taken away some of the blessing doesn't mean there's not any blessing there at all and so we have to thank god in the middle of all of this stuff well that's really hard how do i do that glorifying god and thanking him for blessings received will get harder and this is just part of the timeline of the human race, 2 Timothy 3, one says, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, slanderers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful. Christians, we know this is going to happen. Ungratefulness will abound and get worse and worse in culture. This is part of the sinfulness of human race within our hearts. We don't want to give thanks to God. You fight against that personally in your own heart. And you stand out among the world as a grateful person. You will shine in the middle of people complaining of what's going on. And this is why it doesn't come natural to us because it's, of course, woven within us. And the only remedy is, as you know, conversion, coming to Jesus Christ. These two egregious sins of mankind, a refusal to honor God, a refusal to give thanks to God, the only way for us to actually do that is have that heart change, the desire to do it. A horse has to be led to water because it desires the water. You can't force it there. And so the heart has to change. And so what do you do? You have to believe in Jesus Christ for your sins. You have to believe on him. Your sins are removed. You become new creatures from the inside. No longer do you want to run from God and not give thanks anymore. You have a new heart that desires to give thanks. It's like a compass needle that goes back and you just want to do it again and again. It's spontaneous. It flows out. You don't have to force yourself. It's not something that's onus on you or burdensome. It's a delight. It's freeing. It's expressing who you are. A thankful, grateful being. Not to just random things around us and each other, but to God himself. That's the new nature. 
If you have that, you have a new nature. You are a Christian. But before we can honor and thank God for the glory in this life that we see and the good that we've received, we must know the one true God. See, general revelation tells us some basic things about God. But if you were to look at a butterfly and you write down what you think who the true God is, you're probably not going to come out with the true God because you're going to use your own ideas and everything else. This is why we just say it's called general revelation. We need something specific, more than that. Specific revelation is the Bible. The Bible teaches us the very person of God. And so when we read through Genesis all the way to the Gospels, we come to realization of who this God is. All his personality, he's a relational being, he's a merciful being, he's a patient being, he listens to prayers. And then we come to Jesus Christ, and he's the exact imprint of God's image, and we can look at Jesus Christ and say, there we go, there it all is. I now know who the creator is, not through a monarch butterfly, but through the monarch of all monarchies, Jesus Christ. And every Christian would amen that. Either out loud or in your heart, you're saying yes. And if you're seeking and you desire something more, maybe you're here for the first time and you're kind of interested in God, follow God's little fingerprints all over creation. The inner ear, the monarch butterfly, whatever it is, whatever you see the glory of God, follow that. And he will, by his sovereign power, lead you to specific revelations, specific things about him. How? A church. You're here today by the hand of God. You're online for the hand of God. Maybe a Bible was given to you hand of God gave that to you. Maybe you were led somehow to a conversation with another Christian. Again, that's the Lord leading you as you follow the clues of the magnifying glass. Let him lead you all the way until you believe in Jesus Christ and you become that new grateful creature that you were intended to be. And now we come lastly to thankfulness. Paul says in verse 21, the human race refuse to give honor to God, but they also, we also refuse to give thanks to him. Thanks. Again, this is a symptom of our inward corrupted nature, and this is why we need to be saved in order to be thankful creatures again. As I already mentioned, we need that new heart change. But thankfulness really is so intrinsic to the Christian life that some of the first words that somebody says when they receive Jesus Christ is, Thank you. Thank you, God, for the substitute who died for me. Thank you. Jesus, thank you for going through that for me. And that's why Paul says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The big Christian life is just a massive thank you every day. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for Christ who saved me. That's the disposition of a, of a Christian's heart. And so do you desire to thank God or glorify him more? Maybe you've been forgetting. You're one of the, one of the ones who just tends to forget. Or you tend to forget your, to count your blessings. Or maybe your heart is slow and sluggish. And you look at another Christian and you see, wow, look how thankful they are from the heart. I want to do that. I just feel like I'm going through you know, monotony when I'm thanking at, giving grace at the dinner table at Thanksgiving, just thank you, thank you. You know, I want that actual heartfelt gratitude. How do I get there? I think it goes back to the knowledge of God. We have to believe that God created all things and orders all things after the counsel of his will. And that in that knowledge, we have to have faith that every time there is some goodness that comes our way. We have to see his invisible hand behind it, governing it and guiding it into our lives. Because it's then and that and then only will your new nature see that that was from your father in heaven and you will love him more and want to express that somehow to him more if your heart has really been changed. And this is where this idea of glasses of knowledge comes in. When we're at the theater of God, we have to also, you know, when you're at the, uh, the, the theater and there's the holographic movies that are out there and they pop out and they have to give you those glasses, right? Uh, the multiple colored glasses. A lot of you teens are like, yep, 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 yep. Some of you older folks maybe don't know what I'm talking about. But there's these glasses that help the holographic movie kind of straighten itself out and pop a little bit more. And it's the same thing when we're out in the theater of God. We put on glasses of knowledge. 
knowledge is saying God created all this. God's governing all this. And so anything that good comes our way with the glasses of knowledge, we see it's from his hand. And when your heart is changed, you say, wow, thank you, I love you. I must say thank you. This idea that every semblance of good that comes your way is very scriptural. Matthew 5.44 says, He causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Oh God, thank you for the sun today. Acts 14, 15 to 17. He did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Oh Father, thank you for the great crop this year of a lot of sweet corn in the area. My, my wife loves a lot of corn. I'm not keen on it, but I'm sure she would say that. 1 Timothy 6.17, God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Oh God, thank you for even my coffee this morning. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Thank you, God, for my Bible. Thank you for my church. Thank you for clothes. Thank you for all the fun times I had this summer. Thank you for family getaways here and there. Thank you, thank you. Every form of goodness, the Bible says, is from the Father of lights, a good God. It's not sporadic. It's not spontaneous. It's not a roll of the dice. It is from his heart, and he has actively decided to bless you. We need these, knowledge, these glasses of knowledge when we go through the pandemic. We don't know how long this will go on for this next year. Let's put them on and wear them. Instead, maybe let's put contacts on. Contacts are there to stay, right? And just look everywhere for his beauty and his blessings and with the heart changed in the middle of a movie, changing a diaper in the mess of a day, on the phone call, every meal, You're looking through those contacts and you give thanks to God. Let thanksgiving be more than one day a year. Let it be more than a turkey dinner. Let you as a Christian walk about the whole year, even whatever might come this year, wearing those contacts of knowledge. And with the changed heart, you will give thanks to God. And it will be from the heart. Lastly, a warning and an encouragement. Paul says in verse 21, But their thinking became futile, And their hearts were darkened. If we as a human race continue to take from God, take, 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 and never give back any honor and thanks to God, Paul says our thinking will become futile. That's the warning. Well, what is futile? The word futile is aimless, right? Purposeless. Just driving around randomly. You're not even sure where you're going. It's probably lost. And that's what happens when we look at creation. We don't follow that thought and we suppress it. Our thinking actually becomes diluted over time. This is why many philosophers, when they look at the stars and they suppress the thought and say, there is no God, there's no way, they get trapped up in all kinds of strange philosophies, creating multiple gods, weird ideas, and many of them are driven to depression, despair, and even suicide. Futile thinking, Futile life, how sad is that? What about a darkened heart? Well, if we as a race fail to see all things from the hand of God and we don't give thanks, we will eventually, as a human race, fail to give God thanks for Jesus Christ. And we'll shut him out of our heart. And in shutting him and in grieving him and in hurting his patience and hurt and rejecting his grace, eventually he does back away. And when he backs away, you're more in darkness. And the heart gets darker. And there's less of a desire for God. And if you were so close to becoming a new creation, a grateful person, and going to heaven forever, it's shut off. Your chances of coming and going to heaven and having God and being grateful are getting less and less as he backs away. And your heart gets darker and darker. And it becomes a sad scenario. Because what hope is there for you if you shut the good God out who's been coming after you? 
If you're new here, you're visiting and you're listening to that and you're saying in your heart, yeah, okay, I'm ready. I want him now. I want this God. I want Jesus. I want to go to heaven. I want to be a grateful person. I'm thankful for Jesus who died on the cross. I need him. You could pray like this. God, I confess that I have sinned against you and I've been ungrateful, but I receive you, Jesus, into my heart. Save me from my sins. Help me go to heaven. I trust you. Amen. You can pray something like that right from the heart. God receives it. He turns you into new creation and gives you a hope and a future. Lastly, the encouragement, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Paul says to mankind, Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Therein lie we see the purpose of blessing. One of them, God is seeking to turn people to himself. Even Christians. The word repent means to turn back. Maybe you've been wayward and prodigal and finally you're tuning into church and the message of God. Could his blessings be this last while for you to come back to him? Maybe you as a Christian, you've been cold-hearted and he's just trying to warm your heart with something blessed in your life so that you would come back to him and roll into his arms. It's a tactic to get your heart to come to his heart because he loves your heart and wants you to draw near. So draw near to God And love him for it. This Thanksgiving, I'll conclude, put on the glasses of knowledge and walk about the theater of God in creation. See his beauty and see his blessings that have been given to you and give back thanks from the heart. Amen. Would you stand with us again, please? And can we choose to give thanks to this wonderful, gracious God and sing together, now thank we all our God. It was
Thank you for coming today. Thank you for being online and making the Lord a priority in your life. Even though Thanksgiving can be busy, you're here and you say, no, God matters. I'm going to give thanks to him. So thank you for doing that. Um, if God has reached you in your heart, please come to the front and you want prayer. We have after service prayer team here with some of our leaders or if you need anything, could be healing in your body. Maybe you've been listening and you want to give your heart to God and become a new creature and have a new life change and this is a brand new day for that. Talk to me at the front. Talk to one of our people for prayer and have them pray for you. We have after-service fellowship outside. It's beautiful weather. Enjoy each other's company. Continue to keep your distance and, and cloth masks on here in the sanctuary. We appreciate that. This last song was on majesty. I'd encourage you, if you're new and visiting, come and join us next week as we delve into the majesty of Christ. Jesus said, I am. That was his title. Next week, we're going to look at what that means. Jesus, the great I am. So please join us for that. Let me end with this scriptural blessing in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. Happy Thanksgiving, church.